house, leading to your bedroom closet. Close and caulk. Stand on the roof, pour plaster down into your shoes, around through your shirts, pants, bathrobe, hats. Allow to dry. Remove the hooks, split. Remove the clothes, discard. There is the shape of part of the air. The shape of the air around the sycamore is shot with sparks, elastic, slit with leaves. The shape of the air around the city in cross-section is like a broken cone. Look at the clouds asleep on the gunwales like oars. The shape of the air over the mountain is fringed as a fish. Sheer water stitch and rend, pickerel over the side. The air folds around the muskrat out on the bank. The air slides a slipper cool under his lifted foot. He dives. The air closes the space where he stood. Do you think fish out of water leave holes? With time, money, effort, and above all, the cooperations of her citizens, we could determine the shape of the air around the United States. hiking by myself along the Appalachian Trail one day, somewhere in North Carolina. I had carved four days out of a work schedule. I borrowed a Friday and a Monday that had been promised to a corporation in exchange for sustenance, and taken them to wrap around the weekend that already belonged to me. The weather on Friday, after a perfect Thursday, was weekend damp. It was no soothing rain that fell, no dramatic thunder and lightning, just sopping air. Thick, milky clouds of condensation hanging in the air and hiding the land. I could quite literally see the shape of the air, leaden with moisture. And it perfectly matched my gray and sodden mood, or rather my mood matched the other. I hiked. I plod it on. It is what you do when you have borrowed days to spend. My walking stick beat on stones and then moss, which I could barely see beneath my feet. Dimly perceived peripheral clues kept me on the path, but gave no hint of the beauty I suspected lay on either side of the trail. Even when an occasional stray daisy sprang into view, it quickly disappeared and did nothing to lighten my mood or pierce the visible air. Hours passed in gloom. I pressed on, moving upward. My guidebook told me I was going up, and so did my sense of balance and the pull on my leg muscles. Go or stay didn't matter. Forward or back was an equal choice. The fog, the fog was everywhere, inside my head as well as out. I reached a plateau where the ground seemed steady and level. My guidebook suggested a mountain meadow, but I could not see it. In the deep haze, I bumped into a boulder and chose to sit upon it rather than risk colliding with another. If I brought my arm up to my face, I could see my watch, 11-something. Close enough, I was stopped. I might as well eat lunch. As I chewed in cadence that matched my feet's former weary pace, something caught my eye. Not so much a light as a lifting of the air. Mysteriously, an invisible hand drew back a sliver of cloud on my right and revealed one distant peak. I paused in amazement. It was as if I had forgotten I was in the mountains until then. And then another unseen hand drew back the air like curtains on the left, and another crest was seen. As if choreographed 
patterns of the air shifted and became as light as toe dancers, swirled and pointed and mocked and revealed. The stage before me was lit in perfect revelation, fields of flowers bedecked with boulders, strewn with trees, surrounded by elevations of majestic beauty. My inner climate changed to match this new panorama, this new shape of the air. I wanted to drink it, to embrace it, to keep it as a part of me forever. And somehow I have. I can close my eyes and still see that magnificent revelation. As I watched, out of my childhood memory came a thought, though I had not the language to define it nor the wisdom to believe it. Out of some distant, indistinct recollection came an explanation. Grace. I am experiencing God's grace. I was a Unitarian by then. I didn't talk about God. At that time in my life, I had already rejected the religion, the theology, the God of my childhood. I had already thrown away the entire package, flawed as it was because did not match my expectations nor my experiences. I had thrown away that kind of language along with the rituals and the practices because I did not know how to sort things out from one another. I did not know I could keep some and not others. I did not know there were treasures buried in that old religion, nor how to find nor evaluate. I think my experience is not unlike others who came to Unitarian Universalism out of another religious tradition. And I am discovering that those who came here out of no religious tradition have just as incomplete a comprehension of theological concepts and language as I did that day on the mountain. Many who were raised within the UU tradition have language from another era or have forgotten it. As a whole, we are steeped in ignorance bruised with disagreement, and devoid of a common theological language. Often when we need it most, we have nothing to say. I do not remember anymore how I came down off the mountain that weekend, or how I returned home and went to work the following Tuesday. What I do know is that it was the beginning of a long journey that eventually brought me here. And on part of that journey, I began to look for the meanings of the words that came back to me in fractured significance, called by experiences that had no labels of their own. Words like grace or sacred, salvation, there's a tough one, awe, humility, always annoyed me when those people came on Saturdays and knocked at my door and told me I should have humility. What about creation? I have plotted among these words that point somewhere to something hidden as I once plotted up the trail toward unseen revelation. They have been at first as misty and indiscernible as the mountain air, and then after patience and persistence, the fog surrounding them has been pulled back and I see new landscapes of possible meaning. I invite you to come with me to look at the language that comes from religious traditions, traditions to which we might have belonged or not, but with which we have surely come into contact. I myself still struggle with, with and against some of these concepts. And I invite you to share with me, anytime during coffee if you wish, the ones that stick to you like birds, annoying and persistent in rousing your antagonists. I have learned that ignoring them does not diffuse their power to give me pain. One has to peel away the dross and come anew to their revelation of meaning in order to find relief from them. One has to name them again as we name each new day and name ourselves. One has to shut the door on skepticism to see how an old concept might be useful to a Unitarian on a path to understanding all of life. Perhaps together we can lift one strand of air surrounding just one scene of our spiritual misunderstandings. And so, to grace. I had first intended to 
talk about humility, a concept that I still wrestle with once in a while. I thought I would just jump in admitting my own defeat in this exercise of reclamation that I am recommending to you. But Grace insisted that I start with her. I feel warmer toward the idea, just the opposite of the cold fog of that mountain trail. But just as I don't recall coming back down the mountain, I don't remember exactly how I got to be friends with Grace. I do remember a story that stuck to our family, although it did not belong to us. My grandmother had a friend whose daughter died as a child. The mother was overcome with grief, and she continued to set the table for the girl to keep her room as it was, to lay out her clothes every day, to scatter her toys about the house, <coughs> as if she would return at any moment. The child's name happened to be Grace. Whenever a sound would echo through the old house, whenever a door would open from the pressure of a passing breeze, the mother would look up smiling and say, come in, Grace. This phrase echoed through my own childhood because my grandmother took it up in sympathy or ridicule, I don't know which. In response to creaks and opening doors and unexplainable noises, we would say, mocking this woman's gentle craziness, come in, Grace. And somewhere in my Sunday school teaching, the concept of Christian grace became confused with the idea of a ghostly presence lurking just outside of my view. Perhaps this is why the concept of grace was one of the first to return to me. With my mindless ritual invitation to enter, I was somehow open to welcoming it. In classical mythology, the graces were the goddesses of beauty, daughters of Zeus in Deuteronomy. Grace and beauty have always gone hand in hand, symbols of imagined perfection. And always they were imagined. For any assumed perfection on earth was believed to be simply a flawed imitation of the perfection of the gods. Grace, then, was seen as a gift from the gods, hints of what was possible on a higher-than-human plane. And if the Greek philosophers imagined a set of ideal models that existed in another world from which our own ideas were mere reflections, the Christian theologians imagined that the perfection of God somehow transmitted to humans in individual moments of revelation. This idea of perfection, perfection revealed, became a theology, theology of vision, a vision that God and man could be one, but the work toward this relationship was the responsibility of humanity. To seek God in that concept was to seek grace. Angelo Caranfa, writing in the spiritual images of French poet Paul Claudel, gave this interpretation to such an argument. He wrote, to discuss the notion of grace theologically is immediately to raise the problem of image, of knowledge, of freedom, of the relationship between God and the human person. Although created in the image and likeness of the creator, the human person is seen in the Judeo-Christian context as still steeped in evil, unable to hear the voice of God and see his splendor in the world of himself, by himself or herself. You see, this is where we begin to tune out when we start reading these kinds of things. But stay with me. I'm just going to <laughs> For Claudel, the life of grace is one by which a person is transformed corporeally and mentally to becoming a living splendor, a witness of God's light in the world. In other words, the grace of God becomes the grace of humanity through God's grace and man's work. More simply put, humankind is not perfect, you know that, and has to work at improvement, at maturity, at awareness, even kindness. The world gives and we work to deserve its gift. Simple as that. The grace of God. When my friends and I as children saw someone so hideous or cruel that his actions or his words made us afraid, we were taught to say, there but for the grace of God go I. It was the mantra that was, I think, supposed to bring us to our lifelong work of being better people. And always when I recall that serious teaching memory, I recall at the same time the unsubstantiated story of Winston Churchill 
pointing to a friend, out to a friend, one of his articles in Pompous Detractors, Churchill was said to have proclaimed to the friend, there, but for the grace of God, goes God. <laughs> God's grace interjected into history and into individuals is, in the Christian tradition, God's way of regenerating and strengthening humanity to do what it needs to do, sort of a colorful biscuit for the cosmos. God's grace includes moral strength, it includes clemency, and it covers forgiveness. It includes beauty for inspiration and perfection as a goal. These are the divine gifts of almost every religion. We may never achieve their ideals, never even come close, but their very existence in our minds and in our lives are supposed to be proof of God love, God's love of all creation. God's grace I was taught included love, unconditional love. From this came the concept of divine gifts that were unasked for, unexpected, often undeserved, proof of that love. The freely given, unmerited favor and love of God, to quote another phrase that lingers out of long ago sermon messages of my youth in the Presbyterian Church. To fall from grace is, by your worst behavior, your own willful errors, to become disassociated with God. Added to gifts of grace is the idea that to fall from grace is to fall from God's favor. Much is made theologically of this negative aspect of grace, and I find myself, like many, uh, like my universalist forebears, unable to wrap myself around that kind of a concept of God that would allow us to fall from that love that is supposed to be generated there. The universalists prefer the grace-filled God to the one who allowed humanity away from him, thereby deserving punishment. The God who gave gifts, who showed the way, who instilled courage, who didn't give up on slow learners, was their God of choice, the universal God who did not discard the sinner, but continued teaching through grace, through mercy, through undeserved gifts. The Unitarians, I think, in their deepest convictions thought God fell short of grace at times. How could he, why would he send models of beauty and perfection and in the same gift wrapping include models of deprivation and ugliness, hatred and corruption? The Unitarian endeavor to find grace was to educate the fallen, educate them to see beauty and to reject ugliness. We humans could make choices that would bring grace. Still, they relied on God's gifts to keep them going in this demanding task give them courage and wisdom and clarity. Words written by Unitarian minister Harry Emerson Bostic are included in our hymnal under the section called Commitment and Action. This poem we have sung probably before, possibly without considering what the words meant. But consider them now. Without the tune, you can hear the words more carefully. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown this ancient church's story, bring its bud to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. Isn't it amazing that when we sing something, the words are more palatable than when we just say them out loud? Although I did one time hear that the reason Unitarian Universalists are such poor singers is we're always looking ahead to see if we agree with the theology. <laughs> Transcendent, 
those activities of such a one. It is rather a universal force, both imminent and transcendent, that holds all of creation together, kind of a, a sticky glue, and offers all we need to learn, to be, to figure it out. God, in, in my understanding, comes out of an intelligent universe that is one that we can apprehend with our own gifts of perception, intuition, and imagination. We might never understand all of life and all of existence because we are a part of it, just like you cannot see your own eyes except in the mirror. We cannot see all of life while we are living it. We can see what our eyes are willing to show us, but we can never see our see our own eyes except in reflected image. And the same is true of all of life, of truth, of beauty, and yes, of grace. For me, the concept of grace is the concept of gifts. Gifts unmerited, unasked for, unexpected. Like the view on the mountain I received when my spirit was heavy and unhelpful. Grace comes to us in hints, both subtle and grand, that there is something more than us. I often speak of gifts from the universe. And sometimes I even say grace, as if we all agree that that's what it means. For the most part, if you hear me say it, this will be what I mean. I interpret William Wordsworth's lines, which I believe are from intimations of immortality, as his way of acknowledging grace. He wrote, and I have felt a presence that disturbed me with the joy of elevated thoughts. And that, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting sun and the round ocean and the living air, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of thought, and rolls through all things. Grace, then, because it is unexpected, unmerited, and sometimes unasked for, although I expect we ask for it with every breath we take, is often missed. It comes to us and we don't see it for what it is because we have rejected it out of hand and we have no language with which to talk about it. In her book, Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek, Annie Dillard describes the scene so imbued with that it cannot almost be believed. And she ends her description with these words, grace and beauty abound whether we will or want them. And the least we can do is try to be there. Gifts from the universe abound whether we are looking for them or not. The least we can do when we sense an unexplained presence is to look up and say, come in grace. 